Great to have you with us. I'm Jason DeRussia. Thanks for joining us on this CBS and Minnesota special report. We have prepared a little show that we're calling What the Heck is Going On with Our Weather? Because that's what you keep asking us and that's what we're looking for answers about. It has been very warm this summer and very dry. Cities throughout the Twin Cities have enacted watering restrictions as we all try to conserve water and look for ways to make sure that our plants, our crops, our lawn, all of those things survive. Let's take you live outside on this Thursday morning where the other effect we've seen so much this summer is smoke from wildfires. And so all of these things going on all around the country where it is not just Minnesota that is hotter than normal or drier than normal or dealing with wildfires. We are seeing this everywhere. So we wanted to spend some time with meteorologist Mike Agustinak, who's been really digging into this, looking at it from the micro perspective of what's affecting our weather here in Minnesota, but also the bigger picture yeah. at this, right? Because they're all, they're all interconnected. It's one system of weather around the globe. And and it's easy to look at what's going on, for example, in the Northwest mm. and say that uh, that is far more extreme than what's happening here and perhaps sure. lose sight of what's happening here. But we know that even though this is sort of a standard bad drought as opposed to an extreme bad drought like they had in the Pacific Northwest and have ongoing across the West Coast, it's still pretty bad. In fact, let's take, kind of take a look at the evolution okay. of this. Uh, over the past year, drought conditions have uh, worsened significantly. So let me orient you here on this map. These four different maps show you, starting in the upper left and going clockwise, drought conditions a year ago, six months ago, three months ago, and then currently, and we'll take a closer look at the currently in a second because That's a that big, just came out. big change over the year, right? Huge change. And in fact, if you kind of look at this step by step, we had a little bit of a drought going into the winter months toward the end of the winter, and then it more or less went away. That three month map showing you approximately what was going on back in May. And most of the state of Minnesota was okay. Southern Minnesota was dry, but really in the past three months, two and a half to three months, as we take a closer look now at what's actually happening with this most current update that came out just an hour or two ago, this is a, uh, we went from no drought whatsoever to in some cases an extreme drought in two and a half months. Yeah, which I think a lot of us, you think like, uh, you think of California, which is in a, a more of a perpetual they drought. They call it a mega drought. Yeah, Yeah, for us to have it change that quickly, it does make me wonder, well, does that mean it could change back uh, just as quickly? Uh, probably not. Probably not. Yeah, it's, it's been easier this summer, and it looks to be in the long-term forecast, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, yeah. easier to stay dry day after day after day than to get day after day after day of rainfall, which is exactly what we would need to end this drought. And we'll talk more about those numbers coming up. Let's look at the kind of historical perspective. How often have we seen it sort of this dry? Uh, the answer is not all that often. So this is also a little bit of a, a weird graph here, but I'll, again, I'll try to orient you. What we're looking at from left to right is the past 20 years or so worth of drought history here in Minnesota. And each of these spikes that you see is a period where we enter drought. The huh. higher the coloring, the worse that particular drought category is. So Got light it. yellow, for example, is just abnormally dry, going all the way up to the deep reds, which are the extreme drought conditions, which is what we're in right now. And you see we had one here, one here, one here, and then our current drought is way on the end of this graph over here. So we've only experienced drought conditions this bad hmm. two to three other times yeah. in the past 20 plus years. Going back to 2000, yeah. Yep. So that is pretty uncommon. So it's not an it's not an, an exceptional or historic drought, but it certainly is pretty uncommon. You're right. Uh, lay out some of the rainfall statistics for us to help help us because this is really what drives this for us. It's about rain. Yeah. Right? So let's go back to uh, to. June, and we'll just sort of refresh your memory here for specifically now, this is just the Twin Cities. We only had, uh, what, five days with measurable rain, seven days with any amount of raindrops whatsoever. And that left us in the bottom right there, you see, with a deficit of about two and a half inches below average. Now add July on top of that, where now this does include yesterday, where we got eight one hundredths of an inch of rain <laughs> right, locally. Great. We again have only had so far five days with measurable rain huh. and a trace amount for a sixth Day with raindrops back earlier in the month. And so now, just this month alone, we're approaching three inches below. So that's average. just July. That's just July. Got and then it. when you
you put it all together, going back to June 1st and sort of look at this from a statewide perspective, all the areas that are colored on this map are at least four inches below uh, the past two months worth of, of normals. And the dark browns are six inches or more below the amount mm -hmm. of rainfall we typically would have received in that stretch from June 1st through yesterday. That's a lot of rain. If we got yeah. that all at once uh, on any other year, that would cause flash flooding. For sure. Yeah, and I, the ground probably couldn't absorb six inches in one shot. And right? that's the key. Like a lot of people say, well, let's just get a soaking rain. And unfortunately, the fact is that so much of our land mass, particularly here in the Twin Cities, has been paved over that it doesn't, if it comes all at once, it doesn't soak in. It tends to run off uh, into the rivers and streams, which helps some things, but does yeah. not help our farmers, for example. A lot of it just hits roofs of industrial yep. buildings or blacktop or whatever. Yep. Um, is it unusual to see such uniformity throughout the state? I mean, the whole state is in a pretty yeah. similar situation. Yeah, so I mean, what we tend to see are pockets of right. heat and drought and sometimes uh, the same, sometimes in the same, in the same state. I mean, I've, I've been here 13 years. I have not seen a, a drought map uh, or deficit map quite this bad in that amount of time, but uh, it certainly has happened. But again, in terms of like generations, this is one of the worst droughts in a generation around here. Uh, out west, we've seen the wildfires. You mentioned the term mega drought. Yeah. Kind of what does that mean? So mega drought is something that uh, climatologists use to describe a drought that lasts more than a year or two or even three. This is uh, coming up on a decade or more of below average rainfall in the west and actually, mm -hmm. honestly, below average snowfall because really it's the snowpack that sits in the Cascades uh -huh. and the Rockies that falls during the winter and then slowly melts over the spring and summer months to replenish ground water out there. And that's why we've seen the fires uh, yes. raging in that part of the country. Yep, you've right? got dry ground, dry brush, and then on top of that, the lack of rain on a day-to-day -day basis. But some studies, uh, and I'm going to quote our colleague Jeff Berardelli uh, at CBS News who looked into this, say that the intensity uh, of the drought out west is something like the worst in 1,200 years, hmm. at, at least 1,200 years. Could wow. it be even more than that? Wow. All right, that does lead us into a really good question that w you have to look at. When you see nationwide heat wave, you see the drought all over the country, it makes us wonder why. And what might the link be here to our warming climate? Heather Brown took a look at that good question. Is look at us baking at 97 degrees. Lower 90s to the north. It'll be feeling like 100. 99, that is what we made it up to. Why has it been so hot? There's never one cause for these extreme events. We rank second for the warmest June on record. We've had this persistent flow from the south or southwest where the air is always hot this time of year in a way that this early in the season doesn't usually happen. Add in a lot of sun. But look how dry it is. Sunniest since 1988. <laughs> and our ongoing drought. Dry ground is way easier to heat than wet ground. Is it because of a weather pattern or is it because of climate change? It's because of both. Mike says climate change could affect the jet stream. We were cooking in Bemidji. And our lack of rain. It's still a little too hard to draw conclusions between an event like this and climate change directly. Why? Why is it too hard? We don't have as much data as we would like. We have 50 years of data. We'd like to see 100 years worth of data. OK, so not here. But what about the Pacific Northwest? The more extreme the case is, the easier it is to point to climate change as the cause. It's a stalled out heat dome. It's rough when you're not used to it. These temperatures are almost unbelievable, even for a meteorologist. That pattern that has set up in the Pacific Northwest is so insanely out of the norm. It's like a one in 1,000 year event. He points to this bell curve that shows when the average temperature increases even slightly, more extreme heat becomes possible. So when your base temperatures start higher, your heat waves are going to be more intense. Exponentially more intense. In Minnesota, we're not averaging more 90 plus days yet, but we're seeing them earlier and later in the season. It's been a hot one and we're going to start July on a very similar note. By mid-century, NOAA predicts we'll have 15 to 20 more 90 plus days, and that's in the cities. In western Minnesota, another 35 to 40 scorchers per year. We'll have been saying, I remember the good old days.
Well, about a week after we recorded that segment, the World Weather Attribution Organization issued a finding that said the extreme heat on the West Coast was what they call virtually impossible without human-caused climate change. And this is kind of an interesting group, Jason. This group uh, is made up of uh, researchers, climate scientists from, uh, among other uh, hmm. organizations, Princeton University, Oxford, the Red Cross Red Crescent uh, Climate Center at The Hague in the Netherlands, Columbia University, the Sorbonne Institute, Cornell University, the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Berkeley, uh, California. Everybody came together to hmm. look at these major weather events, uh, and this one in particular here in the U.S., but worldwide to say, okay, what can we look yeah. at that says, that, that caused this, and they go in, and they said this in this paper. Uh, these researchers went into this specific research assignment thinking, assuming that this was bad luck, that this was not related to climate change because whatsoever. this is what we always say, and this is why I'm so glad we're talking about this, because when we have an extremely cold day, People say, like, well, where's your climate change yeah. now? And we always say, well, there's a difference between weather and climate. But in this circumstance, the scientists said, yeah, we usually start from this idea that there is a difference between weather and climate. Yes, exactly. And so if you can go in saying to yourself, this wasn't climate change, right. and then prove yourself wrong, that's a pretty rigorous pretty study. Good. And yeah. the finding, uh, I quoted, quoted that one in 1,000 year event. That's true. They found that as rare as this one in 1,000 uh, year event uh, hap was, if climate change had not come into play on some level, it would have been 150 times rarer than huh. a one in 1,000 year event. Interesting. Now, people ask, well, what about, as I mentioned in that story, what about our drought? The fact is that this drought and our, say, for example, our number of 90 degree days is not that out of the ordinary. We right. had more 90 degree days in 2012 than we do currently right now uh, this year, at least in the Twin Cities. And in terms of a rank of the number of 90 degree days in a given year, we're only half the way to the number one, which was 1988 when we had 44 over huh. the course of the season. Yeah. We've only got 20, uh, 21 so far. And that goes to that idea of like, you don't need to look at Minnesota's weather this summer and say, well, here's your evidence of climate change. We have evidence of climate change. Yep. There's all the evidence you would need. This is uh, probably natural variability, perhaps maybe with a little bit of climate change added onto it, because we can at the very least say that this is consistent with, with. what we could expect in a warming world. Good. All right. Yeah, that's a useful, useful framework to think yep. about it. I want to talk about uh, the future. Uh, which is the hardest part of right. looking, especially when we look at past three, five days, you're like, well, you know, but we don't know. But that's but, what everybody wants to know. Well, right? and uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, has been pretty accurate this summer with their yep. longer range predictions. So what are we looking at for the rest of summer? All right, so let's start with here we are today. How much rain would we need in your community to end the drought? Ah. So that's what this map shows. And okay. we've div divided this up by what's called climate division. So that's why those chunks, those blocks of brown are larger than a particular county. Got this it. is the way that uh, climatologists look at long-term trends. Because the weather doesn't just line up over, over Shisago, a county, county exactly, or something. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the amount of rainfall we would need in one month's time to end the drought today. And the darker browns, places like Bemidji and Grand Rapids, if you look at the scale, that's 11 inches or more oh, in a wow. month to end the drought. Here wow. in the Twin Cities, these sort of medium browns, that's around nine inches of rain. Let's mm. now switch to three months, because that would be a pretty ridiculous amount of rain to get in a month. Right. That's not going to happen. No. Three months, perhaps a little more reasonable. 15 inches plus is what we would need through most of Minnesota to fall in three months to end the drought, or at huh. least get us back closer to normal. Okay. So what is the forecast for August, September, and October? It ain't that. This is the NOAA outlook for the next three months, and this sort of light yellow shaded area is where we think that there'll be a slight tilt in odds toward drier than average. That doesn't mean it's a guarantee, but all the available information we have now points that way. And then when you look at the temperature outlook for the same period, the odds more heavily favor above average. And it's always that combination of not just the amount of rainfall, but how warm are we and how much rain do we evaporate out of the ground? This does not spell the end of a drought anytime soon. No, especially if you're saying 15 inches in three months. Yep. And then we start getting into the winter crops that are so big in Minnesota, like rye, for example. 
If, if we made up the deficit, yes, the summer crops would have taken a beating, but perhaps the winter crops would be okay. Uh -huh. This tells me that that's probably not going to be the case. Yeah, and most of our farmers in Minnesota, we, we, talk, we go to the farmer's market and talk about the cucumber farmers, but the yep. reality is Minnesota farmers are doing corn, corn soy, beans, soybeans, and, and rye. And yep. rye. Yep. Yeah, and so they're feeling it for sure. All right, if you're watching this live right now on Facebook, you may have questions about the drought. Fire them up. Put them in the comments. We will do our best to answer those questions. We did ask you on Twitter earlier today if you had questions about the drought. And we have a couple good ones, and some we may have already touched on. But uh, this question coming in from Al asking about watering bans. Some cities have watering bans. Other cities don't. Should there be state guidance? That's maybe beyond mm -hmm. our purview. But I do want to ask about watering bans during a drought because I will say my brain has a hard time getting around this idea because what uh, to have a watering ban makes sense you would have to have a shortage of water right and certainly if you live in minneapolis or st paul and the water is coming from the mississippi river or the river yes you're there's no shortage right the river is low but yeah. there's no shortage so what is the reason for these watering bans i am not an expert on municipal yeah, law right. however i will say that one of the things you need to look at is the water source some some communities in minnesota get their their water from the mississippi river certainly the big cities do but right. not everybody does no so, i'm on well water in maple grove for example so that's why mm -hmm. a statewide prescription probably wouldn't make sense in this particular case yeah. but beyond that we, we're not purely looking at the river level we're looking at how much each community can pump to put into their storage tanks to have available if there's an emergency. And I mean, we just fire, saw this sure. out in Western Minnesota this yeah. weekend. There was that huge uh, grain silo fire and it took a day to put it out. We right. had a small fire that may have been started by the fireworks at Aquatennial this weekend right. on an island in the Mississippi River. It was just old logs. It took them an hour to put that out and that was a small fire. Right. So really these watering bans, I think are more about making emergency. sure the emergency use That is makes there. sense, yeah. Because even like a municipal well in Maple Grove, frankly, is so deep, like I don't know that a one season drought probably not has yeah. any impact on yeah. it. Yeah. All right. Good question. Well, and we know most of the overuse of water. We there are little things you can do to improve your household use of water, but the reality is Minnesotans love to water their lawns. Mm -hmm. And that is the number one driver of this thing. Okay, another question from Twitter. This one from Isaac. Uh, a sharp increase in the water is everywhere. It even rained yesterday. Drought deniers. I do think, assuming that the, uh, they're not all trolls, and some right. people are, you know, good natured and trying to do their Understand best with this, the information. Yeah. What What's the easiest way to explain, like, in a in a state like Minnesota, where you do have so many lakes and so much water, mm -hmm. like we get it in Arizona and California? Why should we care about a drought in a state like ours? Well, I mean, it comes down to just because you had lunch today doesn't mean that world hunger doesn't <laughs> exist. <laughs> right. So your world is not the world. Yeah. And having, having that uh, wider view and, frankly, some empathy, uh, as all major religions teach, right. to have empathy right. for your neighbor, just because you're not going through something doesn't mean that your it neighbor is not. It doesn't exist, yeah. That's yeah. the that's uh, I saw the abbreviation KSS. Keep it simple, stupid. That right. would be my kiss explanation yeah, for that. Yeah. And we know farmers are dealing with it for sure. Yeah. And you can see it in your own lawn. So imagine having acres and acres of beans yep. like it's a different deal. All right. Good. Let's get to one more question that uh, came in from Twitter and we'll pop that on the screen. We're watching. Uh, oh, this is Jeremy. He was sort of explaining his question about uh, our aquifers mm -hmm. and and Jeremy the thesis of Jeremy's question here is uh, comparing our situation to the West so out West not only do they have a drought issue on an annual basis but they have an ongoing issue of water shortages yes. there here in Minnesota we don't have that same issue uh, does the fact that we have a decent water table deep below the surface, does that make recovery from a drought easier here? It does, yeah. I mean, again, like I mentioned, the, the pure driver of drinking water and fresh water in the West is all about snowpack. They have Snow. very few. I mean, yeah. yes, they created Lake Mead when they put in the Hoover Dam. There are some natural reservoirs out there, but there are pictures from space that those are down 
hundreds of feet yeah, from where yeah. they typically are. And once those are empty or down too low to meet the demand, it's going to take decades to replace those. Our underground water source is a little more resilient, certainly, because it's underground, underground and larger, yeah. frankly. Um, but again, I think that it's incumbent upon us to be conservative in what we use, right. not just for us, but for the future. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, and the, the truth is we all pay for the water we use as well. That's so, true. I mean, there certainly is a personal financial incentive to try to use less water. That's the point be of, aware of, that. of water taxes, That's right? why, yeah. that, exactly. Well, like in my city, you have a water rate here for the first amount you use, yep. and then it goes up, and then it really goes up. Yep. And so if you're an overwaterer, or you have a leaky toilet yep. or outdoor hose, uh, you pay the price. Yeah, stay What's, out of my bathroom. Stop looking bathroom? at my toilet. <laughs> Your leaky toilet, yes. Uh, should, should we do another question? What do you guys want to do? Do we have anything on Facebook? Eric is monitoring. Uh, I can read one here. Yeah, Eric is watching your questions on our Facebook feed. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so we have a question from Simon. Uh, will this dry weather affect our winter precipitation and outlook? Oh, interesting. Uh, the answer to that is I have no idea. They are, uh -huh. not, they are not related in any way. Uh, in general, they, it may ultimately be that this dry spell extends through the fall and winter, but there's nothing inherent about how dry it's been that would control what happens this winter. Got it. This is really just the way the weather has set up over, well, really over the, the uh, northern uh, half yes. of the country, for, for sure. For the last several months, yep. yeah. Okay. Good question, though. Uh, one other question from Todd. Uh, does warmer weather affect the amount of rain? Does, evap does evaporation in the atmosphere come into play there? Uh, <laughs> so we don't have time to answer that, frankly, unless <laughs> you want to go to physics class with me. But yes, they're all related. The, the hotter it gets, the more water you evaporate from the ground. Okay. Uh, and so that technically or theoretically leaves more water in the atmosphere to ring out to create rainfall. Right. But the problem is that we have not seen this weather pattern move much at all. And so the areas that have been evaporating more water uh, have not had low pressure systems to come in to wring that water out over that. So it. the water has been going up into the atmosphere and it's being transported downwind, particularly in the East Coast, which has had an extremely rainy summer. Uh, ask anybody on the East Coast. They've all been complaining about how crummy the weather has been. So yes, what we're evaporating is going into the atmosphere, but it's being blown downstream uh -huh. into a different part of the country. And that's sort of the paradox of climate change. Well, how, and I get this a lot. Well, how can it be both drought and flooding for climate change. It's got to be one or the other. I mean, if you don't think about it, that is true. But sure. if you think even a little bit about it, when we have these semi-permanent weather systems, even though there may be more rain falling over the Earth as a whole, because it is global climate change, again, your reality is not everybody's reality, that doesn't mean that there won't be pockets of drought between those areas of heavier rain. Huh. And the fact is that research is showing in a warming climate, these weather systems tend to get stuck more frequently and longer. And that also might be at play here because we have been under this dry pattern for so long. That's what's amazing to me that we've been here for so long. One more question coming in on Twitter and this from Glenn. How does it compare to 1988? I remember the Minneapolis lakes low and the park grass brown similar to today. Yeah, uh, this is, I, I'm going to do a quick average here and say about half as bad as yeah. 1988. That was, that, was, that was a historic drought for Minnesota. Again, this is a bad drought. It's an extreme drought, but it's kind of your typical extreme drought. Got it. Yeah. Like we've seen a couple, uh, other, couple times other times over the, over the, in the last couple you. of decades. Yeah. Uh, 1988, 44 90 degree or hotter days in the Twin Cities. Again, today we're sitting just in the low 20s. Yeah. Which it seems so drastic because the last couple of years have not had this at all. Right? Yeah, didn't been, we have one year where we didn't even have one yes. ninety? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was in the past five years or so. Right. If memory serves. Yeah, I think so. So interesting. Hey, you guys had great questions. Thank you, keeping us on our toes here. Yeah, really good. We appreciate that. You can keep them coming. We'll check in on those questions online for you. Uh, the WCCO weather app is a great tool, kind of to be up to date. The reality is when it's as warm as it is, we have had some unsettled weather, right? And so those alerts can be so helpful to people. Uh, not only severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings, uh, but also lightning alerts. So if you have a boat, if you're on, out on a boat uh, and you want to be careful, yeah. as you should be, about lightning, it will uh, alert you if you set it to, if there's lightning within a certain radius of where you actually are. So it's a cool thing. And we also learned in uh, our news 
newsroom this morning that Governor Tim Walz is going out to Douglas County to go to a dairy farm to talk about the drought and the impact on the dairy farm. Uh, so he'll be talking around 11 o'clock, so just in about 35 minutes, and we'll have that for you right here on CBSN Minnesota. Uh, Mike, this was fun. Thanks for doing it. We My appreciate pleasure. it. Thanks for having me in. And thank you for watching this special report here on CBSN Minnesota. We appreciate you. We'll have the latest coverage of the drought and all of your news here in Minnesota and western Wisconsin on CBSN Minnesota all day, every day from the powers of the newsroom and the weather department of WCCO-TV. For Mike Augustinak, I'm Jason DeRussia. Thanks for watching.